Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the TF Podcast. I am here with Vinny Lingham, the uh, founder and CEO of Civic, uh, as well as a venture capitalist uh, who's been around in the space for quite some time. Um, really excited to, to have him. Uh, we've had uh, folks from Civic uh, attend and participate in our conferences in the past. And so uh, with that, please uh, welcome, welcome Vinny, and I'd love if you could introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, I'm Vinny Ling. I'm co-founder and CEO of Civic. It's a uh, we're you know crypto company, and we've been focusing uh, up to now on really figuring out the identity stack for for blockchain. And uh, we just announced the launch of our, our new um, wallet. Well, I would say we announced the the, uh, the million dollar insurance plan that we have for our new hot wallet that's coming out. It's tied to identity, so you can't lose your money. Um, and uh, really, that means that uh, we are able to offer you a $1 million insurance policy in partnership with CoinCover, backed by Lloyds of London. And uh, that, makes you, that should make you feel safe about leaving your crypto in our wallet. And because it's tied to identity, if something ever happened to you, uh, you know, your family could recover the funds you know, with your, to, your, to your estate, that sort of thing. So, you know, like in the past, there's a big issue with, with having these wallets where you're storing all this money. What happens? Something happens to you. How do you make sure the keys are safe? How do you make right, sure right. it's safe? And we've taken care of all that. It's, it's actually just really simple now. Um, it's a multi-sig HD wallet where um, you know, it's powered by, by Bitco on the back end. So we've got the, the security of their infrastructure. And we're able to offer a consumer-friendly hot wallet where you can store your funds. Nice, nice. I'd love to just actually jump right into that. Uh, and congrats on that news, by the way. Um, yeah, because when we think about, you know, just overall uh, identity first, you know, being that's what you do. Um, that's often been tied as like a use case. So it's pretty interesting to see that you're, you know, you're actually putting something to that, uh, especially because you hear so often like, hey, like, you know, not your keys, not your wallet, or, you know, if you lose your wallet, you're, you're out of luck. So um, walk us through that a little bit, how you're able to, you know, ensure that um, on both, uh, in both ways of that word, right? I ensure that people do keep their identity tied to their wallet. And then like, yes, if something was to happen, it's actually insured uh, overall. Yeah. So the, the, because it's a multi-sig wallet, the three keys to the wallet, one sits on your, on your device with your wallet. The other one sits with BitGo uh, and the other one sits with us. And we will be moving that to um, coin cover soon. So we won't even hold a key as Civic. Mm -hmm. um, and when you perform a transaction, you need to get BitGo to sign it or, or you know, as a backup key coin cover in the future if, if needed. Um, so just you need two or three keys to sign a transaction. Oh. So it's a non-custodial wallet in that sense where the, the funds are, um, they require two keys to, to, to sign, co sign transactions. And therefore, if you lose your phone, you brick your phone, your phone drops down the toilet, whatever happens, your funds can always be restored as long as the other two parties are convinced that you are who you say you are. And there's quite a, it's quite a lengthy process to restore in the mm -hmm. sense that yeah, it's easy, it's a couple of days, but we make sure that it's not someone trying to, you know, fake who you, that, you know, fake who you are or a fraudster, uh, that sort of thing. So we, we're very big on the identity part of the equation, making sure that that's in place. Yeah. Um, but that's, that, that's, the, that's the, the trick here, right? The trick is how do you able to insure a wallet where, um, you know, someone could, uh, you know, essentially lose the money and, and then make you pay out as an insurance policy. But we're so convinced and so is the insurance company that you, that's, that you cannot do that, that that the, the policy will insure up to a million dollars. So it's kind of like FDIC insurance, right. but for non-custodial crypto wallets. So it, it's just peace of mind, right? You can put your coins in, in your wallet you know, and you, no matter what happens to your phone, you'll always get your, you, you'll always get your money. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about for people that might have concerns about um, just their overall, I, I mean, you know, you are an identity company, of course, but about like privacy or do, do they have anything to worry about in, in that context? Um, you know, if, if this is available in the multi-sig aspect or all the privacy remains the same as it would in any traditional wallet? Yeah, look, it, it's a little, this is kind of a hybrid between, I would say, banking and crypto, right? So, so and the reason is, we, you, we were playing in the middle here. There's this new rule called the, the travel rule coming into effect, right? So every transaction over $1,000 needs to have identity attached to it. Otherwise, exchanges will not be able to accept the deposit from you. So there's this rule coming in place. And what that really means is that anyone uh, who wants to move funds in the real world will need the identity tied to a transaction. Just, it's just the way it is. Right? Any, yeah. any large transaction. 
but we, we decentralize identity. So we keep the identity, your identity information is on your device. And uh, when you do a transaction, so let's say you move money to an exchange, in the future, the exchange will say, okay, who is this? Uh, can we get some confirming information? And, and we can send the information to them saying, you know, and you do it from your device, you transfer the information to them saying, hey, I'm Vinny, and it's verified by Civic or identity.com. And, uh, and the exchange can trust that information knowing that we verified it and accept the transaction from you. So that's how we see it playing out. Uh, it's definitely not a dark wallet. If people yeah. are looking for a dark wallet, then you have all the risks associated with it, but you can keep the money hidden. Sure. Term. Yeah, you're not going to get a million uh, uh, in insurance on a dark wallet, right? So, exactly. And, and yeah. you know what? If, if you want a dark wallet where you're hiding cash from the government and, and uh, you're you know, trying to put money away and score away, that, this is not, the, this is not the, the solution for you. Yeah. Uh, this works with the banking system. So we have fiat on ramps and off ramps. So you can move money from your bank account into the wallet um, and you can buy stable coins. So if you're in a foreign country and you're concerned with, with the way that the government's printing money in that country or what, whatnot, and you don't like the soft currency, you could say, you know what, I want to buy some US dollars, uh, USDC, for example, in our wallet. And we would connect you to a, a through the app, you'd connect to a local third party who's willing to do the exchange, you'd pay the exchange rate. And then you're sitting with crypto dollars in your wallet and safe, secure and insured. And you can leave it there for as long as you want and move it back into your local currency at a future point if you need the cash. Yeah. So that, that, you know, we're, 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 we're trying to play with the existing fiat infrastructure out there, not trying to be a dark wallet. That, that's right. not the use case we're trying to solve. Yeah. And that makes total sense because there's, there's definitely a large uh, amount of the population that needs to, you know, get into the crypto system and uh, you know, they're going to likely be looking for tools like this, right? That makes, that totally makes sense. So you know, but, but the, the funds can be very secured. So, so you, you, you know, you could have a situation where, and I can see this happening. People are fleeing a country because of whatever, you know, the Syrian type scenario uh, may, may play other parts of the world and you, you lose your phone or you, you move your funds into your wallet and you can't take your phone across the border. You have to swim. I don't know, whatever. The phone gets no. destroyed or lost. When you get to the other side, as long as you can restore your phone through iCloud, you can pretty much instantly get access to your funds because we use facial recognition to confirm it's still you on the restore. But if you've lost access to that as well, as long as you can verify your identity with, with two of the, the, the counterparties holding two keys, you can retrieve those funds. So this is a good way for people to feel safe that no matter what happens in any war-torn disaster area, environmental, whatever, you can, your money's safe. Yeah. It's super safe and it's insured. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. You know, going back to the, the banking on ramp aspect of things, cause that seems to be a very, um, it's a, I don't, I don't want to say new, but it, it's getting more attention, right? Something like 10% of all the banks are at least exploring uh, a stable coin or stable currency. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I often say that, you know, I, I think in time we'll find that that's where the majority of the crypto on ramp will be is in banking uh, for, for new, of course, not like quantity wise, but as far as like from a, a transactional aspect of it. Um, so how does that, how does your system currently work right now? Or what's the intended purpose within the banking system? System. Is it you kind of like a plaid type API where you know, people can connect their um, their their fiat or, or whatnot, or, or how does that how does that operate? So the way we built the, the infrastructure, Civic is just the wallet technology provider. We don't actually take custody of the funds ever, and in fact, you know, we're trying not we, you know we won't even be holding the keys in the future either. So so literally, we're we're an infrastructure provider. And depending on what, which country you're in, we're going to connect you with a local provider that's licensed in that country to do transactions. So in the U.S., for example, in 40-something states, it's WIRE, W-I-R-E. They will, uh, in, in using Plaid, will connect to your account. You can, you can withdraw funds from your bank account, and WIRE will do the exchanging that they license for and give you crypto dollars or give you, uh, um, you know, Bitcoin or whatever else it is you need. Uh, they, and so we're, we're basically trying to connect local service providers around the world to a common interface. So here's an example, right? You're in the U.S. You want to send money to um, a friend in the U.K. You would use um, Wire and Plaid to access your bank account. You'd take $1,000 and load up your Civic wallet. You'd send those coins, the USDC, stable coin, not going to fluctuate in, in value, to your friend in the U.K. And then he then uses the local provider there and we haven't announced who it is, but a local provider there who will take those USDC coins and exchange it for, for pounds in your local bank account. 
Mm-hmm. And you could you could leave it in your wallet if you wanted to, but if you wanted local pounds, it's basically you know money in the U.S. sent across to the U.K., money out into local currency. Got it, and, got and, it. and 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 that's it. So, so, but the power of this is we can connect people around the world with the same infrastructure. As long as it's a local provider that's licensed that can exchange the, the the crypto dollars into local currency and vice versa, we can create a global net, a global payments network that's ultra cheap. Okay, we're talking like fractions of a penny to do transactions to move money around the world in a legal and 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 uh, regulatory compliant way. But in all times, because we're not a bank, we're not holding your funds. The users are always in control of their funds and they're moving the money around. Think of it as a, a real peer-to-peer um, system for moving money around. Yeah, yeah. Oh, super interesting. Um, you know, I'd like to touch back a little bit kind of on your background. So, you know, you've been an investor for quite a, quite a long time. And uh, I love talking with people that have been investors uh, that got into blockchain and crypto, right? Because it seems like from a traditional investor standpoint, there's been, call it a little bit of fear or hesitancy of getting in. You know, what got you interested overall in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain at, from like the, that investor hat to then say also like, hey, you know what, I'm going to start a company in this space as well. So I, I started off in 2012 with a company called Gift, mobile gift cards. And we're trying to solve the problem of sort of digital payments and moving money around. Uh, and people were trying to buy gift cards, you know, Amazon gift cards was a quintessential example, right? People wanted, yeah. people in foreign parts of the world in, in Africa wanted an Amazon gift card so they could buy stuff on Amazon because Amazon doesn't accept, or well, doesn't at the time, a Nigerian credit card or a Botswana credit card, even as an African credit card, because the fraud rates in those countries are a lot higher than they are in the US. And so back then, in 2012, it was just being declined. The only way you can get your or either your goods or services, or even just buying digital books or whatever it is, is using a gift card. The problem is we couldn't accept those credit cards either because the fraud was so high. We're just we were just attracting a ton of fraud. We had Vietnam, for example. We had thousands of dollars just you know were just being stolen uh, from our system. And you know, uh, it was one afternoon. I was just working late with like canceling every single order, hmm. and I was just trying to figure out how do we solve this problem. And I started looking around for digital cash solutions and found Bitcoin. Plugged it in, worked like a charm. And we were the largest Bitcoin processor by 20, you know, 2014, 2015. We we're processing 5% of all transactions on the blockchain. The Bitcoin mm-hmm. blockchain is going through Civic, uh, through Gift, sorry. And so I had a, I had a very interesting journey there. But, but I think my journey was really around digital wallets because that was a gift card wallet. So taking gift cards out of your wallet and digitizing them. And with Civic, we try, I tried to do the next step, which was take your driver's license out and create a digital ID. That hasn't taken off to the same extent that we'd expect it to partly because of the regulations and lots of other things, but I think that things are changing quickly with coronavirus, so that may take off in the future. We, we, we've managed to get some really good partnerships done with JCI, uh, which is Johnson Controls National, the largest uh, access control company that own Tyco, for example. That's just rolling out, but it's taken us four years, nearly five years to get to this point. Yeah. And, and, we, and, and what we did was two years ago, we said, look, what else can we do? When we look at what's left in the wallet, it's basically money. Uh, you, know, so you take the gift card out, it's money and an identity. And so, well, money and identity are very closely linked because most of these transactions are going to require identity. And so we built version two of our wallet, which is what we're launching now, the Civic Wallet, which has got your identity credentials baked into it. So you can still do all the same identity transactions. Um, you'll be able to do build, building access control, logging into websites, et cetera. But we focus heavily on payments right now because we think that um, we can drive digital identity a lot faster if people are using this day to day. So when you go to a vending machine, if you're able to prove that you're over 21 and make the payment with one uh, transaction, it changes everything. Like vending machines right now with Corona, you don't want to touch them. I don't want to touch a vending machine. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. I'm happy to scan a QR code there and then pay and verify my ID and whether it's a beer or it's electronics, that's a lot, that's a lot cleaner. So I think we're going to move to touchless payments where people start using their personal devices to scan codes to transmit payments instead of swiping a card and then handing your driver's license over to the cashier to check that you own the card. I mean, this is going to end. Like, yeah. I don't have to give my driver's license to anyone to touch. You know, it's, it's just like not going to happen. I went to the grocery store the other day and I don't want to touch the screens for self-checkout. I was like freaked out. And yeah. maybe that's just me, but like this virus is real. And I think we, 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 we it's, it's kind of like, um, there's no turning back now. I think we're all very aware of this, this virus. Whether it disappears or not, there'll be another one in a couple of years or whenever. And, and I think people will just be more, more hygienically sensitive. So I think we're going to move towards digital uh, payments and, and, and a, a cashless world. Because even cash carries the virus, right? So they, they, they're mm-hmm. quarantining 
dollars coming from China for up to two weeks now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy. It, well, it's crazy too, because even, you know, before this all happened, um, there's actually the highest circulation of cash ever, you know, right now. Um, but, and, and so like, even though people have having this narrative of like, Hey, we're going to start slowly start eliminating cash. Um, you know, if anything, this could definitely be like that precipice to, to get it started. Right. Like why, why, uh, why do that? Um, super crazy. Um, you know, with that, let's just jump into what's happening in the world with COVID and so forth. You know, I, I've seen that you've been pretty vocal, uh, you know, on that overall. Um, one thing I've actually been enjoying talking in some of my interviews is, um, in, I'm wondering if you notice the same thing, but it, it seemed as though that those in, in the crypto space were just more aware of what was happening sooner Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and obviously some like even way sooner, like people like Balaji has just been like been very good about providing information. Curious, like what your thoughts are on that? Like, why do you think, uh, why do you think those in the, in the crypto space were just so much more aware of what was happening beforehand? Yeah, look, I think the, the people in, in the crypto space, I look for Balaji in particular, he's got a very strong medical background. So he, he saw this coming. I think people in the crypto space understand uh, exponential growth very clearly. Yeah. Um, I, but I think it's just crypto. I think it's just the tech space, right? So a lot of people who are sounding the alarm are people who understand virality and, and viral coefficients and growth rates. Because this is what we have to do for a living. This is how we, you know, we hack growth. Right. And when we, look at the, when we look at the infectious rate of this virus and how fast it was spreading, just do a couple of back of the envelope math you know, equations and you'll see this is going to be out of control soon. Totally. And so I think we were just alarmed. And I think people tend not to see what hasn't happened before happening now because you have a kind of a, a status quo bias. Like, oh, it's not going to change. It's the but then when you see the, like, I think people just look, they look at numbers and they just, they don't, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Some people just like, they just get, don't get moved by it until it's on their doorstep. Right. That's actually kind cognitive, of interesting. cognitive dissonance. That's what it is. There you go. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting point because like for me, like, you know, the rally part, you know, that definitely stuck with me, but it was also just like simple compare and contrast. Right. <laughs> like, so when I was thinking about what was happening in China, I was like, okay, they got beat with this. Supposedly they were done with it after, you know, two months, but you know, they, they were pretty heavy handed. And then you see Italy, how, how out of control that got really quick. And so even a couple of weeks ago, it was like, man, we're not doing the same things that they're doing. This is going to, you know, this is going to blow up and um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how things progress, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty nuts. I mean, the Bay area has been hit really hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Businesses are shutting down. Um, and I, I quite, I don't quite understand the stimulus package that the government's put out. I mean, it's, it's pretty horrendous. Yeah, uh, they could have done a much better job, but it was definitely politically motivated. A lot of the like, you may remember when a bill like a two trillion dollar bill comes up, people can sneak in a billion, yeah, a billion, and no one notices, right? Everyone's focusing on the big numbers. And if you're giving it to you, your constituents and people who you want to have vote for you and support you, then sure, it makes sense. People are basically buying votes using this, this fiscal stimulus. Um, and some of the things in there were just ridiculous. And it, it is what it is. Does that mean there's gonna be inflation in the U.S.? Probably not right now. Um, because of the global demand for dollars as a, you know, a unit of account and a store of value. Mm -hmm. So inflation probably won't rear its ugly head for a while. Yeah. Hopefully it probably will, but not right now. Yeah, totally. Totally. You know, so you're, you're originally from South Africa, correct? I am. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what, how does this affect, how does, how does COVID or just the global market, how does this, what's the South African point of view on this? Uh, I haven't heard too many people talk about that. And just curious, like from, you know, either your relationships or people you're talking with, or just what, you know, what, what does it look like uh, over there uh, from an eco economic standpoint? My biggest concern right now is actually for Africa, India, uh, other parts of the world, uh, South America and potentially as well. Uh, the more emerging markets, the people living in slums, people living in townships, yeah. Uh, yeah. villas. Uh, there's no way they're going to contain this. Yeah. So this is, is a ticking time bomb. And literally, there's no way to defuse it. Um, I'm looking at, you know, obviously follow South Africa closely. The government did a good job of moving quickly on this and locking down. But locking down is not locking down there. People are still traveling. They're still sitting in eight, 12 person taxi. They still. Um, you know, moving around, this virus is going to hit the rest of, I mean, think how hard it's hit the US, right? New York, yeah. <laughs> for example. 
one of the most sophisticated places in the world. Uh, can you imagine Africa, Lagos? Yeah, no, it's awful. Like, I, I, I'm, I, I think in the next four weeks, the U.S. peaks in the next two weeks, most likely, two to three weeks, okay, uh, based upon the numbers and the stats we're seeing. Uh, the rest of the world is probably going to feel that pain about middle of May, end of May. Yeah. That, that's when it gets to peak. And I know they're trying to flatten the curve. I just, like, I'm seeing videos. I'm seeing stuff come out of South Africa, which makes me cringe. People, you know, there's a social welfare system. They've got to stand in line to get it. People are going into taxis with eight, 10 people in a taxi, and they're going to go and get, stay in line to get their social grants because they, that's what they need to do. There's no yeah. digital cash there. Right. And so as much as the government's locked everything down, people are allowed to go get their money so they can buy their food and supplies. But they, in the process, they're going to get, they're going to contract it and it's going to spread rapidly through the townships. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm hoping that it's, it'll be contained to the lockdown. I don't see how. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's super, it's super scary in, in places like that. My family's from Venezuela, so I've been keeping a huge close eye on that. And, you know, in Venezuela, for example, uh, just on a normal day, they don't have enough medical supplies. Like, you know, it, it's a, it's a well-known thing that if, if you go to a, a, a basic hospital, you, you might not have the, 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 not even PPEs. I mean, just like cotton, you know, swabs, band-aids, just the, the normal stuff. Right. So I'm definitely terrified for them. You know, I don't like to comp to compliment the Venezuelan government too much, but, um, they actually have done a pretty decent job as far as saying like, Hey, everybody needs to stay home. And if you, it doesn't matter where you go, you have to wear a mask. Um, you know, even if you're in your car, you have to wear a mask, which has been good, you know, on that, the mask subject, right. There's been lots of interesting points of view on the mask uh, who is still saying that you don't have to wear a mask, which is, is crazy to me. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what do you, what do you think about this whole mask thing? I mean, the, the data speaks for itself, right? Um, if you look at, um, I mean, David Sachs actually posted, a. um, uh, a story on his Twitter. I think who, let me see who wrote it. Uh, I, I think it was a guy named Sui Hang who wrote it. Um, and, uh, you know, it explains like literally the math behind, uh, well, the science behind masks, right? Coughing, sneezing, how far the droplets go, large spell, exhalation, etc., and how this stuff stays in the air. And what's amazing, if you look at this, the, you look at the stats between, so the science behind the masks, and you look at what other countries have done to implement masks and how it's working to reduce the spread. Yeah. It works. Right. The, re the right. only reason we're not doing it yet is there's shortage. So let's be honest with the American people in the U.S. Hey, guys, wearing a mask will stop the spread for sure. We're running short. So please don't buy until it's in the stores and don't hoard. And yeah. don't go, you know, like, hey, but like, don't say it doesn't work because that's just a straight out lie. Right, right, right. Yeah, like wear a handkerchief or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Wrap or, a scarf or something around your mouth, exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's been crazy to me, too. It's like, hey, just because there's a global supply chain issue doesn't mean that they're not effective. <laughs> like, that, that, that's, a, that's a poor way to, to kind of bring that out for folks. So obviously this, you know, COVID has had a, a dramatic impact on uh, the, the stock market overall, the crypto markets as well. Uh, it seems like crypto is, is you know, for the better part has actually, I don't want to say rebounded, but has, has maintained uh, while other things have become more volatile. Uh, you know, I'd love your thoughts on that overall. Just, just, just first on as far as, you know, is, is COVID basically just what popped the, the growth, the, the 11 years straight of, of growth, where we're going to head that way anyway, um, towards a, to towards some level of recession. Um, what are your thoughts there? You know, it, it's hard. It, it really is hard to say. Um, the, the issue right now is that the narrative around Bitcoin and crypto in particular, well, Bitcoin in particular and crypto has been, hey, you know what? This is an uncorrelated asset and therefore you should buy it because in times of, you know, economic strife or market upheaval, or whatever, it's, it's a better gold. Okay. It's a better, it's a better version of something that's been around for centuries. It's, uh, but, but it, it is just like gold and therefore it'll withstand, um, market volatility. That was the narrative up until about a month ago. The reality is when the rest of the market tanks, so did Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. and, by, and, and, and by association, every other altcoin. Now, it doesn't mean it's not in the long term. It just means right now it's definitely not. Because the whole point would be that people would see this as an alternative asset or an uncorrelated asset. 
and 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 investors that move money out of correlated assets to something which is non-correlated to the market and store their money there, know it's safe. But now we know that if the stock market tanks 25%, Bitcoin's probably going to tank 25% at least on the way down. So it, it's, it is correlated. And so this mm -hmm. is the issue. It's, if, it, if it is correlated, then, well, if you want market exposure, you got to choose whether it's better to have Apple stock at 220 bucks or 240 bucks than Bitcoin at, you know, 6,000. Mm -hmm. And what's going to give you a better five-year, 10-year view? Um, if you think Bitcoin's going to go to the moon, then that's fine. Have some Bitcoin. But if things start getting, like, you know, we, we, it, it, it becomes a, a financial question, right? If I said to you, you can have Bitcoin at 6,000 on a five-year hold, Bitcoin at 6,000 today or Apple stock at 50 bucks, what would you take? <laughs> Apple stock at 50 bucks, most likely, right? You, 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 you probably can do 10x on that almost guaranteed with very low risk um, over a, a five-year period. Bitcoin, yeah, it might go to 20, it might go to 15. It's, like, you don't know, right? You know, it could go to 100,000, it might not. We don't know yet because it hasn't been proven to be a, an, a, a, a store of value in a bear market. It's been proven to be a good creator of value in a bull market, but it hasn't proven to be a good store value in a volatile market. And we're about to go into a major global recession. Will Bitcoin be able to hold value in a global recession? We don't know. It may, it may not. Um, my, my guess is that if the dollar goes through deflation, it won't. Because the whole argument for Bitcoin as a store of value is that it's, you know, it, it's, it, it has a low rate of inflation. And therefore, if other currencies are inflating faster, this is a better way to store your unit of account, store of value, whatever you want to call it. But if the dollar goes through deflation, what happens then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're on the verge of a deflationary economy. Right? People don't appreciate rates can't go lower. I mean, we can go to negative interest rates, but like we're, we're at zero right now. Right. Yeah, which is crazy, right? First, there's there's no more levers to to pull pull down on that. So you know, when when we think about Bitcoin as an uncorrelated asset or a cor or being correlated, you know, perhaps in this context, um, you know, gold often is used as the analogy or or the um, the parallel to to Bitcoin and so forth, right? And mm -hmm. so as as people pull out of the market, um, you know in theory or, or, or in history, I guess people slowly get back into gold, right? Like it's kind of like the first, uh, they might sell their gold, but it'll be the first that they go back in. And well, so I, I would challenge that, right? So now yeah. you've, got, you've got a situation where the, the third largest gold holder in the world is guess who? No, I'm sorry, uh, who is it? Sorry. Who, who, who's the third largest gold holder in the world? Is it a person or a country? The country. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, are we, are we going Illuminati here? No. <laughs> um, uh, third, uh, let's go with China, U.S. Is it China Italy. or U.S.? It's Italy. Okay. Italy is on the brink of, I mean, this disaster has hit Italy really hard, right? Mm -hmm. And they're in, they've been in financial difficulty before then. There's an, I tweeted this article out a month ago. Um, Italy's the chairman of the lower house budget committee and whatever league, league's economic spokesperson said, about a month ago that we do not want to sell a gram of gold, okay? And the Italian government has no intention of selling the Bank of Italy's gold reserves to plug budget holes. That was, that was a, sorry, a month ago, it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. It was February 12, 2019. Are they selling now? What do you think is gonna happen? Like, like I mean, let's just be frank, right? They've got 2.5, uh, 2,500 2, tons of gold as of last year, right? Yeah. The, the, the economy is in a standstill. It's in total lockdown. They've lost so many lives. I feel sorry for them. But like, they're going to have to borrow money against that gold or they're going to have to sell that gold. And this is, reminds you of you know, 1999 when the Bank of England sold its gold reserves or a large portion of it tanked the price. So this could happen again. So, so gold, it's a great store of value if no one wants to sell or no one needs to sell, right? But if people need to sell, then the liquidity the equation changes very quickly. Kind of yeah. similar with Bitcoin, right? If someone sold hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin or, or a million Bitcoin, um, you know, it would tank the price because the markets are just not that deep right now. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's an interesting point of view. So, you know, would when you're th when you're thinking about from an investment standpoint and you're putting on your investor hat overall, uh, what are your thoughts overall when it comes to Bitcoin or the broader crypto um, market? You know, I think that there's um, it's, you know, the, the crypto space is extremely volatile and, and, and it's got a lot of upside potential. Like people are going to make a lot of money in crypto over the next five to 10 years. 
uh, the, the, there will be a crypto that goes up, uh, goes up 100 times, 500 times, whatever it is. There are going to be a few of those, but there are going to be lots of losers along the way. Sure. But the ones that win are going to be paying off in spades, right? Now, you can't ignore the sector because there'll be a lot of wealth collected and, and, and created in this, this sector. Um, but uh, you know, how do you play it? I think you know, portfolio approach is probably better than individual you know, picks. Um, the maximalists, they just buy Bitcoin, but we've seen that you know, it's not always that simple and, and other cryptos could outperform. I think a, a healthy balance portfolio of crypto. So let's say you know, if, if I was suggesting to someone coming in, and remember, everyone's different, so I don't like sure, giving sure. advice. But yeah, let's, yeah. Just, let, let's assume like, hey, I want to get into crypto. Uh, first thing I'd say is, oh, what's your net asset worth? Like, what do you have in assets? Someone said, well, I have a million dollars in the bank. I said, well, you know what? You probably want to have most of that in safe investments, but take 500, uh, sorry, take 50000 to to $100,000 maybe and put it into crypto. I would just put that up. Maybe do a third in Bitcoin to a half in Bitcoin, put maybe a quarter into Ethereum, and then the rest, uh, put it into some speculative things which are interesting and up and coming. You know, you can pick the stuff you want, but have a portfolio that looks decent, and you can have some speculative stuff. So, like for example, you know, you might put ten grand into something which can go up fifty to hundred x. That pays off your entire portfolio, right? Um, uh, if you get hundred x on on a ten k investment, that's one percent portfolio. You pay off the whole portfolio, but that's great because now you've got a balanced portfolio because you've got your crypto stuff, which if it goes from ten percent to twenty or thirty or forty percent, you're producing really great returns in the overall portfolio. And if you pick it really badly and it doesn't go anywhere, if you're generating returns in the rest of your investment portfolio, you'll be okay. Um, some people don't have that view, and some people, and, and it's different, right? If you have a million dollars of the assets versus fifty thousand, like if you have fifty thousand bucks, I'd be like, well. Keep as much of it in cash as you can. Maybe take a couple of small five hundred dollars, thousand dollars, two thousand dollars bets in crypto. But that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't you know? Don't overexpose yourself. Everyone's wealth profile is different, and anyone who thinks you can put a hundred percent of your money into crypto is nuts. Because you know people need money to live, pay for living costs, houses, mortgages, emergency, medical, etc. You can't be. You can't. Crypto is very illiquid in the sense that it's you know if the markets are down, you have to hold all. You can't sell. Uh, otherwise, you're taking major losses. You need to have liquidity elsewhere to pay for things. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not robots. We live in the real world. But I, I think there's just too many people who are just overexposed in, in the crypto portfolios. Um, 70%, 80%, 90% Bitcoin. That's their entire wealth. And I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's, it's gambling to some extent. It's not guaranteed that it will work. And if you hit a speed bump and you have to sell, then we, you have to sell at a bad time. I mean, can you can imagine you bought in a ten thousand last year, or twelve or thirteen thousand, and you need the money right now. You're going to be selling at six thousand. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, that's the problem. So, you know, putting your uh, your your venture capital hat on. Did you did I read that you started a fund or that you you're part of a fund, a new fund? Did I read that right? So, new fund. I started this company actually 2014 before Civic. Um, I started with my business partner, old business partner from Cape Town. We started a VC fund. They've been running it for five, six years now. And we just uh, raised a $20 million fund from a, a single LP, um, a London listed company, a logistics business called Imperial Logistics. And we launched their Imperial Ventures, uh, Imperial Logistics Ventures um, division. And my venture capital fund there does the management. And, and, and so, you know, we, 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 you know, we're, we're the fund manager for them. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, we've worked with them for a while now, past couple of years. They, they like the team down in Cape Town. Lou is my, my business partner. He runs it. You know, my, my full-time job is running Civic, but obviously I have, I have other interests. And uh, Lou and the team do a really good job. I sit on the investment committee for that. But we look at some really good things, and we look at making good investments and making a difference in you know both Africa and the rest of the world. So we, uh, and if people out there, by the way, are in the blockchain space, in the logistics, specifically logistics enablement, get hold of me. LinkedIn's a good place, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to forward your 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 proposals onto the venture capital team there. Uh, and Look at those uh, investments, but we, you know, I think venture capital is critical to the world, right? You, you got yeah. to find entrepreneurs with great ideas and great business skills and help um, help give everyone a chance to change the world. Yeah, so so that fund in particular is focused on like the log overall logistics supply chain type space. That's exactly it. So supply chain logistics, um, Imperial's biggest play in Africa, and they've got Middle East and Europe. Uh, coverage as well. And they don't really operate much in the U.S., but we can invest anywhere as long as there's some synergy to the business. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, so the reason I wanted to bring that part up or just about from the venture side is, you know, I'm curious as, as you look at other companies, you know, I'm sure you get approached about companies to invest in either, you know, pers as a, as a single, 
you know, investor or so forth. Um, what's interesting to you from a product standpoint, from uh, people that are building products in the blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin space, like what are the types of products that you want to see or um, that you find interesting that are investable? I mean, right now I'm looking for things that drive usage of blockchain, not uh, infrastructure necessarily. I mean, there are a couple of really good infrastructure plays out there. Uh, I'm, you know, through, I'm obviously a partner in Multicoin Capital with Bashar and Kyle. And so we've, we've made some really good infrastructure investments. Uh, particularly, I think recently Solana is one which we're very excited about. Um, Solana is a great uh, infrastructure play, uh, high speed, high performance blockchain, layer one scaling. Um, but and, and, and I led the original deal bringing them into Multicoin. So that was, that, that's one of my sort of you know, most exciting projects that I, I like in this space. Uh, and, but that really solves the supply side of the equation. It doesn't solve the demand side. And I'm interested in seeing how we can build demand side of businesses where um, it, either, you know, like the, the product you're selling scales by itself independently in the economy and it just uses blockchain as a back end. Yeah. And, the, and then it's taken care of. So kind of like Civic, I guess. I'm, you know, I'm drinking my own cool idea. But, but um, Civic is a good example where the more users we onboard, the more transactions that go through identity.com, which relies on the CVC token. And, and so that drives volume and, and adoption and usage of blockchain, even though most people won't even know that they're using a blockchain on the back end for this stuff. And so I, I, like the more we can drive blockchain adoption without users knowing that they're using blockchain, the better, because people don't, wake up one day and go, I want to go use a blockchain service. Right. They, want, yeah. they want to be able to move money around. They want to, do, um, they want to scale up some service that they need, you know, whatever it is. And if there's a blockchain that can do it securely and safely and cheaper than traditional centralized database, I think it's a, it's a big win for the industry. Yeah, most definitely. It's, it's really interesting how that's changed a lot too from the narrative of uh, founders in the space, right? A couple of years ago, founders would always say like, oh, I have a blockchain company or I'm building a blockchain company. Mm -hmm. And now people seem to be very aware of like, hey, like, you know, you, you have a, I don't know, a real estate company that hap real estate tech that happens to be using blockchain or, you know, a payments company that happens to be using blockchain to make sure that you're really covering, you know, what you actually are doing, right? Yeah, and I don't think I've changed my tune at all in the past couple of years. It's always been about utility and adoption. It's just taken longer than I've expected and longer than most people expected to drive it. But I think if you don't, if you don't focus on it critically, and you don't say, hey, how do we drive adoption and usage of this particular service? You're not going to achieve your end goals of driving uh, adoption. I think blockchain for me is largely infrastructure or an industry that's about to be created. That industry will be uh, an industry of decentralized services. And it may not be decentralization to the nth degree. Yeah. Maybe just, you know, one, one or two layers better than what we have today and more efficient. And it may not be orders of magnitude. So this is why cost is important. So we've got to get the industry to focus on low cost transactions in blockchain. This is why I like Solana. because It's just super cheap to do transactions. And um, if we can figure out ways and all the blockchain services out there, you've got to drive costs lower. Even us, like we're running Civic. When you go and create a wallet, there's a gas cost, right? We, we're, we're bearing it right now. And that's expensive. So every wallet creation costs money. So good for us because we use identity, so you can't create multiple wallets, so we, you don't get civil attack in that sense. But um, you know, it, it's hard to do the services we have without identity because scammers can get hold of you and just drive your costs up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that is interesting too, right? When you think about it, you know, what, when you think about either civic or just in general, and and how there's these gas costs and. Um, how does that become scalable? Is that something that it just needs to evolve? Like there needs to be a migration at some point or, or that those gas costs need to be um, diminished or what, what's, the, what's the play on that in a long-term capacity, not just for Civic, but just in general? Depends on the chain. Every chain's got its own narrative and its own sort of ideological uh, beliefs, right? And so it depends on the chain itself. Uh, I would say that Chains that focus on trading off, you know, centralization and security to some extent for lower transaction fees may be better for certain use cases, right? You don't need to have, you know, level 10 security when level seven or eight will do if it's 90% cheaper. And mm -hmm. so you know, it's, it, it's, 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 they call it you know, the scaling trilemma, right? So how do you, and then centralization as well. Like Solana, for example, says, you know, Anatoly always says like, you only need 15,000 nodes. 
um, to achieve decentralization. And for blockchain people, for Bitcoin people, that's insane. 15,000 nodes is nothing. We have 5,000 today, and in the future, we need to have millions. Or, you know, like they don't want to quote a number, but their belief is that you just need to have an infinite number of nodes for decentralization. I think that most people will be happy with 15,000 nodes being reasonably decentralized, and as long as the fees per transaction are a fraction of a penny, no one's worried that, that you know, for the types of transactions on the network, that people are going to attack the network. Um, you know, now, I can understand the Bitcoin perspective that if you're doing billions of dollars in transactions that you can't afford any, any security uh, you know, um, lapses. So fine, you need to have a more secure, more expensive, uh, slower, heavier network. Well, that's fine. But that's a trade-off that that community decides to do. Every community is different. And yeah. um, I think it's more about driving the demand side of the equation and seeing what, like, for example, in logistics. The logistics industry, if it adopted blockchain, probably doesn't have the margin to pay a lot more than they're paying today in terms of centralized databases for moving the stuff around. So they're going to need something which is a lot more, uh, you know, it needs to be high speed, instant, highly available. And they probably will sacrifice centralization for that because they'll say, look, it doesn't have to be decentralized because we trust all the logistics companies in the network. We know who's who. And as long as they can't easily modify it, and if they do modify it, we know who 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 renege on a transaction, that's good enough because reputation matters in this network. And so we'll go with a lower level of centralization or lower level decentralization rather. And, but we want much lower cost because we, we, you know, for the volumes we're doing, we, we just can't afford to have a high cost infrastructure. So that's yeah. the way like, we should look at it is that every industry will have a different uh, uh, sort of menu of what it wants and you've got to trade off things. But you can't have everything. You can't have super fast, super decentralized uh, and super secure at low cost. <laughs> All in one, but it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point of view, and I, I agree uh, on on most of what you're saying there because it's it's like, you know, from Bitcoin as being decentralized obviously makes a lot of sense from that context, right? Of all the reasons why you want Bitcoin, um, and you know, oftentimes when you have like these uh, quote unquote, um, you know, dethrones of of Bitcoin, it in fact actually makes Bitcoin stronger, uh, or at least um, it improves the use case for it, why you want it decentralized. But like what you're talking about, when you go to the shipping context, or um, or transportation, or logistics, or healthcare, or you know, it's like it, it needs to just be decentralized enough for the participants in the network, right? Like it, like as long as those people that are participating in that transfer back and forth feel like it's decentralized enough for them or they all have access you know at, at some point of view from like a, a maybe even more from a read standpoint point than even a write standpoint yep um you know then then that becomes interesting like they don't need it to be publicly available to every single human on the world um it, it doesn't it, oh, it just, well it, i would i would disagree there I, I would say the point of blockchain is to have uh, public ledgers. I think that private ledgers, even for corporate purposes, you might as well use a centralized database. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would argue that if you want to have like public blockchains are really what blockchains are about. The information is there. It's in the public. You can obviously encode the transactions and the data doesn't have to be clearly visible, but you need to see the transaction happen. Anyone needs to witness the transaction happening. So I, I would argue that, that if companies wanted blockchain-like features to be like a DLT internal uses and what's the point of using a blockchain it's just it's expensive mm -hmm. and if, if it's so so the, i think the, the point for me is how decentralized should it be right sure, sure yeah so so, so it really, it's a cost quick like it may be really expensive to run a node but you know if anyone can run it then it's good because then you know you can say well there's people checking it there's industry watch dogs etc um so i i, I would say you Every industry will have its own sweet spot, and I don't think it's a one size fits all for every industry. Um, but I think that there probably will be, you know, a handful, five or ten blockchains that win in the public blockchain space, and then yeah. people will, will go. And so that's things like smart contracts, obviously oracles, um, you know, high, high performance networks. That's yeah. Everything. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, well, with that, Vinny, you know, I'd love to leave it to you. Like, if there's anything you want to kind of say in closing, or uh, any questions you want people to to think about as they go about their day uh, while they're listening to this. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'll take the opportunity to plug Civic <laughs> one more time. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love everyone to go to Civic.com and sign up for the new wallet. Uh, it's coming out. It rolls out 
different, you know, you'll be on the wait list. There's 150,000 people on the wait list who are rolling out in the next 30 days. So we're very excited. Uh, it's a payment network, so you can send money around the world. Um, and we want you to tell your friends about it, use it, send, use it to send money, um, low cost, it's insured, best part about it. And we think that this helps get crypto to the mainstream because people will feel comfortable storing their crypto in their wallets, knowing that it's insured and it's safe and they can't lose it. And, uh, and um, yeah, we, we thank everyone for their support over the years. And we hope that this becomes a, uh, a driver of real consumer adoption of uh, crypto. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Vinny, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Looking forward to seeing what, what you do with Civic and, and elsewhere. And uh, well, hopefully we'll be talking to you soon and, and catching up on, on how that went. Thanks, Jonathan. Good time. All, right. All right. Have a good one.